Good morning, friends. It's me, Joel, and welcome back to Energy Express. Get on your hiking boots and pack a snack. We're going out into the forest. Yep, the forest. Let's go learn all about rotten logs. Hello everyone, I am Sheldon Owen, Extension Wildlife Specialist with West Virginia University Extension Service. Today we are at the West Virginia University Research Forest right outside of Brewston Mills. I'm along with my colleague, Dave McGill, I'm the Forest Resources Extension Specialist. And today we're gonna to be looking at some of these logs that are down on the forest floor and kind of seeing what kind of habitats they create for organisms and plants and things like that. Well, when we're thinking about habitat out in our forests, what are the three main components of habitat? Food, water, and shelter. Or a lot of times when we talk about wildlife, we talk about cover because they don't build their own shelter. They just use what is available to find cover, to find protection. And one of the things we commonly overlook are just these down rotten logs, trees that have fallen in the woods or a limb that has fallen off. And as it is sitting on the forest floor, it is it's decaying, it's rotting, and it creates this great little micro habitat, if you will, because it's providing cover for a lot of our small salamanders, maybe even uh, mice, rodents, uh, voles that could be using this. And as it decays, it's also creating a great place for insects. So as uh, insects are, are, are growing inside of these logs and they're feeding on some of these logs as they are decaying and it's providing protection for those as well. Yeah, one of the organisms that sometimes we overlook when we see one of these large logs on the forest floor are the fungi, and they are actually the ones creating this habitat. Different types of wood decay fungi, you know, they get in there, their little strands of hyphae grow and decompose the wood and make it softer and more absorb more moisture for, you know, creating your microsites for these small creatures. So it, it doesn't look like much, right? And, and whether this, when this tree fell, it made a noise or not, or made a sound or not, it's definitely an important component of our forest and woodland floors across West Virginia. And it doesn't have to be a very large log. Like we're, if we look along the length of this one, this is a tree that has fallen over, but it could just be a limb or some, some bark, it's exfoliating bark that has fallen off. Anything that creates that cover can cre create a micro habitat for a lot of different species. You know, the moss creates uh, the initial habitat. Of course, it holds moisture very well. And uh, if you look under here, it's actually probably developing a little soil, but these little birch seedlings, they'll grow and they'll put roots down and the roots will extend all the way down into the ground. And then when the log decomposes, you'll have these trees called stool trees that are kind of standing and they can be eight, six, eight feet tall. Yeah, so if you are collecting moss for a terrarium or a fairy garden, something like that, you just kind of come up to the log, lift it up, and it comes up in a mat. But you don't want to take too much because you want a sp to leave a space and you want to leave some other plants, other moss here, so it regenerates that spot that you collect it from. So if you look under here, you can see a lot of this uh, material where that's already decomposed on the, on the tree itself. You can see you can actually pull some of this stuff up. It's actually very soft materials, like, like compost. And so, you know, you, all these white things, that's fungi that's continuing to break that down and, and, uh, and create a better, you know, habitat for small little creatures. So if you were to take all of the salamanders that are around here and, and the, the reptiles that are around here on our forest floor and kind of pile it up, the biomass that, is, uh, that will result from that is larger than piling up all the birds or piling up all the mammals that are found down here. So, you know, it's always a good idea. Maybe you can see that my hands are still wet because these, uh, amphibians will absorb any type of chemical or water and even oxygen through, the, through their skin. If we're handling these with dry hands, we're actually drying the salamander out. And so you want to make sure that your, your hands are wet when you're handling these. It makes it a little bit more difficult because they are pretty, pretty quick and, and, and slick. Uh, it can escape quite easily, but you don't want to dry them out. And also keep in mind that whatever you have on your hand, if you have lotions or uh, any type of perfume or anything or, that, that could be on your hand, that amphibian is now absorbing it uh, when, when you're holding it like this. When it's, you know, the temperature is right and we have a little bit of rainfall, it's moist enough, these will come out and walk around on the forest floor. So you'll actually see them on top of the leaf litter uh, that's on the ground. But because they have to stay in moist environments, as the leaf litter dries out or the, the conditions above ground dry out, they'll actually dig down into the ground looking for that moisture. And it could be six inches to a foot, maybe even two feet deep 
that they're digging down looking for that moisture to find the perfect environment, the perfect habitat for them to, to stay moist uh, and stay alive. So what we found here is a juvenile form of our red spotted newt. You can see the red spots along its back with kind of the black outline. Now these are juvenile and we, and we talked about how most of our amphibians, the young are in water and the adults are on land or, or, or can be on land. Whereas the red spotted newt, the juveniles are on land and they can stay on land in this phase and this is called the red eft phase for maybe two years or more, two to four years. And so they're just walking around. You can see they're a little bit drier. They still need some moist conditions, but they're a little bit drier and can handle drier conditions than many of our other salamanders. But if you look at this coloration, that lets us know that there's something different about this species and it is slightly toxic. So if a, a bird or something were to come along or a snake to come along and, and try to eat this, you know, it's very bitter tasting. So it will actually spit that out. It won't kill the animal if they eat it, but it can make them sick and gives them a bad taste. And if you pick these up, it won't make you sick, but it's always a good idea to, to make sure you wash your hands after you handle any animal uh, to make sure that you're not picking up anything that it could, could be carrying. So when you're out flipping over logs, maybe flipping rocks, you know, always be careful because you don't know what's underneath it. We do have some venomous snakes, two species of venomous snakes that occur here in West Virginia, and we don't want you to be bitten by those. So whenever you're flipping a log or flipping a rock, you always want to kind of flip it and roll it towards you. So if there's a snake on the opposite side, you know, it's away from you and you can, you know, if you, if you needed to, you could quickly drop it back in and keep yourself protected. Uh, but just, you know, keep in mind that we do have venomous snakes out there and be safe. Uh, be snake aware when you're out in the woods looking around uh, to make sure that you're, you're protecting yourself. Never pick up a snake because we always want to know, you know, they're fun to handle and they're fun to see, but you always want to know and make sure which species of snake it is because these venomous snakes can, can bite and will bite uh, if you pick one up uh, and it could cause some serious harm. Okay, I think today we've looked around at some of these logs, what's under them, the small microsites of these trees that have fallen and creating great places for small creatures to live. Found some pretty interesting critters so far. We found a, a eastern redback salamander, uh, the red F stage of the eastern spotted newt. Uh, and we also found, what else we did we find? Slimy, but it got away. We, we saw a slimy salamander, but we missed it. We found one of our dusky salamanders out here. So it's a, a great opportunity to get out and explore and find some new critters. Across West Virginia, we have 35 different species of salamanders. Uh, now, they don't occur everywhere. So only some only occur in s small areas like the Cheat Mountain salamander only uh, occurs up in high elevations around Cheat Mountain. Um, and so you may not find it. And so as you go out in your backyards and explore, there may be some different salamanders that you may find. But remember, as you're, you're going out and you're looking, we encourage you to explore and find these things, but always leave the habitat, the area, as you found it. And so if you, if you flip a rock over, flip a log over, always put it back and place it where you found it because something's using that for protection and for cover. Uh, and keep your hands wet and keep your hands clean when you're, you're handling these because those salamanders are absor absorbing whatever's on your hands. Uh, and you can dry them out if you're ha handling them with, with dry hands. Um, but we definitely encourage you to get out and explore, find the mushrooms, the, the fungi that are out there, the salamanders that are out there, insects that we really didn't talk about today. One of the funnest things you could do here in West Virginia, explore the forest. Cheap, easy, and a lot of fun because you'll never know what you're going to find out there. Next up, let's go down in the forest and make a fairy garden. Hi, my name is Becca Finn Clark and I'm the WVU Montague County 4-H and Youth Development Extension Agent. Um, this is my daughter, Aurora Clark, Rory, and she is a Montague County 4-H'er and we both really enjoy being outside. Today we're at Mason Dixon Park in Core, West Virginia in Montague County to check out the Ferry Doors and the Ferry Door Trail. We have some really fun activities and things to show you um, that you can make for your own fairy garden at home or if you want to make some fairy doors at home, um, that would be great. Okay, Rory, tell us about some of the things that um, you have made that would be perfect in your fairy garden. The books um, with pillows and I got some flowers and inside the flowers, the, the flowers came inside these little cups and I, and I took some scissors and I cut a little door and now, you can put it down and it looks like a house. This is a bottle and my mom drew some grass around it and some windows up here. So this could be whatever you want. It could be a house, 
but I feel like it looks like a greenhouse because it has grass and two windows up top. We have this that my mom made. So why did I use why did I use sharpies and markers and paint? Why? Because you can't use paper. Because if you use paper, the water will make it all soggy, then it will disappear. Right, so we think that using markers and paint, you can use paint, see we painted this one, um, works a lot better than, than paper. Because yeah. it's going to be outside. And we also made this one that was painted too. And it has a bill and mm -hmm. we, used it, we used an old ice cream container. Um, I made this at school. You use popsicle sticks and tape. And it's just like a gate that can open and close. I think the fun thing about making a fairy garden at home is you can use things that you can find around your house already. So like the plastic containers um, and the things like that work perfectly. But you can also, if you have access to a store close by, um, like a craft store or a dollar store, you can also easily find fairy garden items there. Like so, the Dollar Tree. Like the Dollar Tree. So we got these super cute gnomes on some ones like holding up some flowers and ones on old person and another one is on a log like this mm -hmm. and we got a dog a campfire and a Easter basket mm -hmm. and we also got these really cute vegetables lettuce carrots and even more carrots and hey Rory if you were gonna make a fairy like a little person fairy if you couldn't find these at the store what could you use to make them well I would say clay mm-hmm Play would be good. Or Play-Doh? Yeah, Play-Doh would be good too. Mm -hmm. And then also you could just cut out some little tiny people and then you could laminate them. Oh, that's true. And then put them, in, then like, then like, then put them in your fairy garden. Well, you could make them out of sticks? Yeah. Could make you make a person out of sticks? Yeah. So you don't have to have fancy, expensive items to do a fairy garden at home. This one we just usually just did popsicle sticks and glue and like, well, we used hot glue so they would stay together better, but we also, we just used popsicle sticks and this is what the back looks like. But this is the very colorful front, doorknob, windows, this. Um, this is a ceramic tile. So again, you could paint a door on that. Um, very inexpensive at a hardware store, very, very inexpensive. And so you could paint a lot of different things on these and that would work really great too. There's lots of places in West Virginia, beautiful places in West Virginia that you can find fairy gardens, fairy doors. Um, and if you can't find a place locally, if you're not able to find a place, we would encourage you to go out and find a place around your home county or in your, even in your backyard where you could build your own fairy garden. Let's head over to the Botanical Garden and talk with Dave and Erin. Hi, my name is Dave McGill. I'm the Forest Resources Extension Specialist at West Virginia University. And today we're here at the West Virginia Botanical Garden. We're going to talk to Education Director Aaron Smaldone. Hi, I'm Erin Smaldone. I'm the Education Director at the West Virginia Botanic Garden. So I manage all of the educational activities here at the garden. So that includes our weekend public programs, our walks and our workshops, as well as uh, school groups that come throughout the year, the summer camps uh, during the summer, uh, our family walks that we have on the first Friday of every month, and uh, some of our community events as well. Yeah, it's, it's uh, so important, uh, this facility, because it is focused on basically botany, right? Plants, and, and uh, you know, there's been a lot of information out in our in research about uh, the, the lack of, of plant education for, for people. Right. And uh, we, we basically have kind of a bias towards more animals. We focus on animals rather than plants. And so, so how, how does your facility, uh, you know, make sure people learn the plants? Right. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so a big part of our mission is education-based about, of course, plants, but also nature in general and, and the interactions between plants and, and animals and people as well. Uh, so we have lots of different educational opp opportunities where people can come learn about the plants in general, learn about pollination, 
um, the importance of insects and the relationship with insects and, and flowers for pollination purposes. Absolutely. Um, so, so it seems like there are are different educational approaches for different ages, you know, from the children to the adults. Do you capture that in a particular way? Um, we have a lot of nature type walks. So like we were just discussing, we have our, our fall mushroom walk that happens every year in the fall. We have a wildflower walk in the summer. Uh, in the spring, we have a wetland amphibian walk that's real popular. So those are just a few examples. So, so, so when you do these workshops, uh, you have to have a person there, but it seems like uh, I've seen some signs out here. Do you also kind of have that type of education in mind, a self-guided? So we have our interpretive signs, and that's a way for people who are just coming to the site on their own to learn about um, part of our history and our ecology as well. Um, so coming soon, we're going to have a new sign outside of our pollinator garden, which will teach about pollinators and, and their importance and how to create your own pollinator garden. And then we're also going to have a new bird blind um, out in our meadow area um, and a sign that will talk more about birds and the di different types of birds that you can see um, close to the wetland. Uh, yeah, and then we're going to be working on one about hemlocks back in the forest as well. You know, you, you know, thinking about this facility and what you were just talking about uh, draw, brings to mind, you know, our we all want to be healthier and happier and, you know, we focus on the mind, body, spirit kind of things in life and, and, uh, and you go out in the woods and and do you ever talk about forest bathing? Uh, Charlie Ewell comes here and he is currently working on his certification to be a certified forest therapy guide. Um, so he has been leading, uh, he's done a couple so far and he'll be doing them monthly, uh, forest therapy walks. So he will take people out in the woods and, and do different exercises to help them get more in tune with their surroundings, really slow down, observe the forest, um, take it all in and and think about what that means to them. So it, it's really neat. So, so why do you think uh, the, these types of places are so important to, to people? I think there's a lot of reasons, you know, like, like I mentioned, a lot of people just like to come here and walk. Um, just being in nature is very relaxing, very freeing. Um, it lets your mind kind of wander um, and be still. But also, you know, coming here and learning um, whether you're learning about the natural environment, you know, we have various different uh, natural habitats here with lots of different types of trees and, and wildflowers. This one is called lavender. And um, a little bit later in the season, we'll get these tall spikes of purple flowers. Uh, but if you crush the leaves, very nice scent. Um, Sometimes kids don't like it as much as adults, but I know adults really like this. It's used very commonly um, in like pillows and things to help people relax, lotions. Um, it's a very nice smell. And another one that has a fun smell is this one. It also has purple flowers and the bees and other pollinators really like the lavender and this one is called cat mint. And as you might expect, it smells like mint. Ooh, I love that smell. <laughs> it's just so nice and refreshing. <laughs> yeah, so you can kind of just crush up a leaf and take a smell. So these are some nice plants to plant in your garden if you want to have um, some nice fragrance in your garden. They're, they're also good at um, deterring, um, you know, rabbits or, or deer because they don't especially like those, those scents or, or those tastes. I think it's neat that you mentioned uh, that you're an ecologist and, and, uh, and, the, and the educational value of these students and people and, and, and uh, you know, other visitors that uh, come and, and learn about that gives them kind of an, a sense of, I would think, a sense of how everything's connected. To come here and just be surrounded by natural beauty um, and to learn about, you know, if they come to nature camp, they're going to learn about plants insects, birds, wildlife, water, and how they're all connected. And, and I think it's something that kids don't really think about um, on a daily basis, but when they learn about it, they're truly fascinated and they want to learn more. And, and um, you know, it's the beginning of lifelong exploration and discovery. Okay, it's that time, snack time. What do you think we're making today? Hmm? Oh, well, it's mushrooms. Let's head over in the kitchen and learn how to make a stuffed mushroom. Hi, my name's Tim Sayre. I'm the Putnam County Extension Agent for Family and Community Development. And this is my son. Michael Sayre. And we're going to show you today how to make stuffed mushrooms. 
Now, before we got started, we washed our hands and we got ready to cook. That's why we've got our ball caps on and our aprons on to keep us good and clean and keep the food safe. All righty, let's get started. First, before we start, we washed and cleaned our mushrooms. These are portabellas, and I got these because they were on sale. You can use white mushrooms or anything else. Michael, I got a question. Why do you think people hang out with Mr. Mushroom? Because he's a fun guy. Uh, that's right. These are the jokes, folks. Anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead and make stuffed mushrooms. First thing we have to do is we have to take the stems out of the mushrooms. Why don't we go ahead and start doing that? And we'll put the stems right here on the thing. And then we'll chop them up. All right, once we've stemmed all the mushrooms, we've got to chop them up. And let's talk a little bit about knife safety. I started Michael out with small plastic knives and taught him how to handle them safely, just as if they were real knives. But what we're gonna do, I'm gonna let him, cause he knows how to do this, chop up these stems. And just, I'll show him how to do it and then he can do it. Yes. A good job, Michael. And the thing is, don't be in a rush. We're, this is something you could do as a family, and it's fun to take your time. And these are important life skills for your children to learn how to cook. And Michael, when you hand a knife to someone, how do you do it? So what you want to do is you want to grab the blade and have the handle facing them so they don't grab the blade. That's very true. Knife safety is something that you really need to talk over with your children. I think the sooner they can handle a knife safe, the sooner they can start helping you in the kitchen. Now, after we've done that, we're going to saute the mushrooms. Now, we are going to add into our skillet a couple things. Usually it calls for vegetable oil, but this time we're going to make it a little bit healthier by using vegetable broth and kind of braise them. So. We'll pour a little bit of the broth in there. Just enough to cover the bottom. That's all we need. Then we add the mushrooms. It's a little bit, and I'm putting it straight in because I want the mushrooms to take on some of that vegetable broth flavor. Gotta get those two. The other thing you add is a healthy bit of chopped garlic. It calls for a clove, but I'm of the belief if it can have garlic, eh, let's put a little more in. So there's a little garlic. Maybe a little more, Michael? Yeah. Okay, so a little more. And then, if that's not enough garlic for you, we have a little bit of garlic powder to put in there. These are garlicky mushrooms, let me tell you. And then mix it all up. Kind of let that broth, garlic, and mushrooms all come together. And we give it a few minutes. Now you do need to season your mushrooms right now with a little salt and pepper. And all we do now is saute and let this cook down. You want it to get down to a pretty dry consistency. And if you haven't chopped up your mushrooms, this is a good place also just to kind of kind of push them down. But big pieces aren't a problem. This is not an every time food. This is a special occasion treat for your family and your kids. And it's a neat way to get them to try new things. Now, a couple of things you could do to make this even better, and I haven't told him this yet, but we may try it, is add spinach to this. And if you add spinach to it, it's a good way to get your kids to try greens for the first time. And the stuffing can be anything you want. The mushroom and the cream cheese, you can add pimentos, 
peppers, uh, olives, all kinds of things. But this is just the basic recipe. And we're gonna add it into our cream cheese mixture. Now be careful, this is warm, but that's okay. It's gonna help break down the cream cheese a little bit. Help melt it and make it a little more gooey. Now what I'm going to add to this to help thicken it just a little bit is we're going to add a half a cup of Parmesan cheese. And Parmesan cheese is a lower fat cheese, so that's a good choice too. And the final thing that we're going to add is entirely up to you. I like to add a pinch of cayenne pepper. Now, what I consider a pinch and what Michael considers a pinch are two different things. I'm gonna take some out and then we're gonna decide how much we want. Just a pinch? Mm-hmm. Is that a pinch? Mm-hmm. Are you sure that we want a little more? No. Are you sure just a little more? <laughs> All right. And now comes the part that this dish gets its name from, stuffed mushrooms. So we're gonna take some of the stuffing, find our caps, and fill them. And don't be afraid to put a good bit in there because they're gonna brown nicely. <laughs> That's a lot. We've preheated an oven to 350 degrees and we will place these in there and bake approximately 15 to 20 minutes or until liquid begins to gather on the bottom of the pan. That's one way. Uh, the bigger the mushrooms, the longer it can take sometimes, so don't, don't panic if it takes a little longer or shorter according to the size of your mushrooms. Now, let me tell you, these are the temperature of the sun right now. And you've got to be careful, so take your time and get them out. Michael, do they look good? They look delicious. All right, and this is your stuffed mushrooms. Shall we try one? Mm. Mm. What do you think? Good. There you go. This is an easy recipe to do, and it's fun to do with your kids. So thank you all for joining us today, and we hope to see you again sometime. Yeah. Hey, thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you all tomorrow. Have a great day.